It's old home week here. Um, anyway, uh, we're here to do a Q&A. Ricky has asked us uh, not to say anything during the Q&A, so it might be a little bit slow, but we'll do our best. Uh, any questions? What he noticed some other kinds of older magic alchemy books about alchemy in the montage of books. And yes, and wondered if Ricky is interested in that kind of magic as well. I'd say he's interested in all forms of magic, at least pre 20th century. Um, and he has a huge collection of very old, beautiful magic books. So, yes. Anyone else? Yes, in the front. Uh, yes, I didn't realize the film was so much about the relationship in the past between disciple, masters and disciples, and, and secretly was part of the relationship and all this time together. And I wondered if this entered into your relationship with Ricky as you made the film. I would say very much so. Um, you know, in, in any filmmaking situation, the, um, there's a, a, a process of earning one's, uh, the subject's trust. And uh, in the case of a magician, that, that uh, earning of trust uh, is a much more delicate operation. Um, so I think that this aspect of his life, this uh, the historical aspect, the, the relationship that he had with his mentors, was something that he felt comfortable talking about. He wasn't going to divulge secrets about the actual effects, um, but he loved to talk about his mentors. He loved to talk about uh, the world of magic, not the technique. Yes. No. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. Um, did you do magic the way you did growing up? I didn't remember watching Charlie Chaplin magic the way you did growing up. But She's lying. Uh, what led me to this film was the uh, mountebank sitting to my right. It's um, Molly Bernstein. It was her idea. She is the creative and logistical engine uh, behind this film and deserves a warm Northampton welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I will say that, that neither one of us, at least I think I'm speaking for Molly, had any uh, background in magic and, and actually not much of an interest in magic per se. Uh, we were very interested in Ricky Jay and his, um, his character more than, than uh, the magic uh, itself, which we, we love. We love to watch it. We, uh, one of the, the best uh, compliments that we've gotten about the film is magicians who say, you have elevated the art. Uh, we don't know much about the art, but, but Ricky Jay has elevated the art, and um, so that's really what got us interested, his obsession, his, his character, and his uh, drive to uh, be the best at something. Uh, I don't, but I know it goes back... Oh, the question was, do we know who figured out that if you, you can hypnotize a chicken the way that Di Vernon explains? Um, we do know that it goes back much further than Max Molini. Uh, Ricky has a chat book from, I think, the 17th century called A Droll Trick of a Cambridge Scholar that has an illustration and a description of that trick, and he thinks it goes back even earlier. So and we wanted that in the film, but we decided um, Di Vernon had to have the last uh, word on that, so. 
I wouldn't try that at home. Uh, yes. It's, um, you know, Ricky's, oh, the question was, you repeat the question, I guess, um, about Ricky's childhood and that there's a lot of warmth perceived here when he talks about his grandfather, but then he had this break with his family and did we learn more about that? And I'll say, you know, what Ricky's manager says in the film that he's never had a conversation with him about his parents and they've been very close for 35 years. So. It's something he really doesn't talk about to many people, if any. So, you know, we don't really know more than that it was, it's a sore point and he really didn't see his parents again after his grandfather died. So he really did cut himself off completely. Yes. What was the last part? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, he's asking about the extreme close-up shot that we used for the BBC journalist, Susie McKenzie. And it is the only one we did that close, other than Ricky's hands, obviously. But, um, and I think, you know, we just had a sense that this is supposed to, this is representing a magic effect. So it's really about her perception of it. So it seemed like a good idea to really be very close on her face. And so you could really see what the, the emotion and the response. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, he does. Uh, he's still doing uh, one-man shows, and I believe he also does, um, like many of these close-up magicians, does um, private, private engagements. Uh, so he's still quite active, and he's active in many other ways, as a writer, as an actor, a uh, collector. There's a big uh, book show going on uh, now that he's probably at. Um, so he he is still uh, performing and and uh, very busy. We'd like to we'd like to have him here. He he's actually hosting something called the Congress of Wonders in Rhinebeck this summer that you can look up online if you're interested. It's a weekend with all kinds of events that he's curating, and we're going to show the film there. But there'll be other people speaking and performing. Way in the back. One might, one might imagine that uh, the camera would reveal things that uh, the public audience might not perceive. Did you get any sense of anxiety on, on the part of uh, Ricky performing all these tricks for you? Is this someone who always wants to be in control? Did, did he have a lot of input about how you were making the shots? Yeah. Um, the question was, did Ricky have a lot of input on how we designed the shots when we were filming him performing because of the possibility of giving things away? And I would say remarkably little. I mean, I would have thought he would have had a lot more than he did. I mean, there were certain uh, things where there were certain angles he, you know, kept us away from in a sense, but barely. And. Um, one thing that's really interesting is that, you know, if you slow down the footage, you know, there's nothing revealed, uh, at least.
I was joking. <laughs> no, I, I, I learned nothing, and, and I'm one of those people that isn't really that interested in, in knowing how these things work. I'm not interested in how a car works or, um, you know, it's, it's magical, and I'm glad it's there. But, but there are people, and, and many maybe in the audience, that, that are fascinated by this, and, and uh, it is what draws uh, young people into magic as, you know, as kids. Um, No, only that uh, he w was allowed to approve any performance footage we used. So we showed him uh, everything we were using, and in certain cases he said, oh, that's sloppy, use a different take, and we would have never been able to tell it was sloppy. Whereas, <laughs> you know, in, of his performance and also the mentors, actually, he'd say, oh, there's a much better shuffle Charlie does, you know, two shuffles down. I mean, he was very keen on having the magic be the best that it could be. So in that sense, he had a lot of input. Um, I would say very slowly. <laughs> um, how did we get to make, convince Ricky that, that we could make the film was the question. And as Susie McKenzie mentions, there was a BBC documentary, an hour done on him, that uh, was not a smooth production <laughs> for many reasons, uh, mainly because they were trying to get Ricky to perform things for a camera that he really couldn't, that it had to be spontaneous, like in the restaurant. So we agreed to that. We, weren't, we knew not to try to push him to do things he didn't want to do for our camera. And um, what else was I going to say? But I think the other thing you said, which is just patience. We were very. Um, we had no deadline, and we really let him go at his own pace, which is a very slow one. And um, I think that was a big factor in, in him feeling comfortable with us, that we weren't pushing him, we weren't asking him to be a trained SEAL, and we were just letting him do his, uh, to, to go at his own pace. And I think there is a, a certain uh, testing or vetting process in this of, you know, um, you know, how are they, they going to do after the first five years and uh, um, that kind of thing. So, so uh, patience was probably the top of the list. Yeah, I know that he's um, friends with David Blaine and likes his work sometimes. <laughs> um, and he does like other people. I, you know, we haven't talked to him that much about it, and we didn't get into it for the film just because we were focusing on this very small group. Um, but yeah, he, he definitely, there's a, an Argentine magician named Rene Levant that he loves. Um, there's somebody in Spain named Juan Tamiras. Um, who else? He, he does have a lot of performers he loves. Uh, no, he didn't ask, but we did send, and Molly had, uh, actually, um, we, when we approached Ricky, we both had, uh, when I say we, Molly and I had uh, small resumes in, in the filmmaking world, but they were resumes that I think uh, interested him. Ricky happens to be a real music uh, aficionado, and he did, I think he did appreciate the first film I had made about a, a vaudeville musician. Uh, and Molly, meanwhile, had, had made a film about um, middle-aged, uh, middle, uh, medieval uh, alchemy uh, as, a senior, as a MFA project. 
So they were two very different films and both very much connected with him. Um, so I think that helped as well. Yeah, I would, uh, the question is, um, how did he like the film, and did he think it was a faithful representation of, of who he is? And I would say uh, he liked it very much. I, I think that um, one of the things that he liked about it is that, that it was not a biography. It was not uh, merely the story of his life, but it really tried to show uh, his life in the context of his teachers and, and in the history that he is so devoted to... Um, uh, disseminating. So I think that was the most important uh, thing that he liked. How do we mark it? Very good question. Well, um, we have a distributor who has distributed. We the it's played in about 50 cities um, in the United States and Canada. We're about to go to some film festivals in Europe, so we're hoping to spread out there a little bit. We have um, streaming on many services. We have a DVD that's for sale in the lobby, if anyone's <laughs> interested, that has almost two hours of bonus materials on it. So if you want to see more from the cutting room floor. Um, and how else? We just, you know. What more do you want? <laughs> <coughs> Uh, right at the very end there. <laughs> we have a couple different projects. Um, one is quite related to, to this in the sense that it's about someone with a very obsessive interest. Um, and what else? Nothing that we're really ready to talk about, but... I've been too busy applying for uh, law school, so I <laughs> haven't really... Right there. The, um, the question was about the three mirrors that Ricky's practicing in front of. Um, it was our idea, but we got the idea because it is something that magicians do frequently so they can see what they're doing from the point of view of someone sitting near them. So we, we asked him to do that, and he did. So yeah, it was great. Uh, we loved doing that. It was I think in terms of, uh, the question was about the um, spiritual and philosophical aspects of magic and, and was that a part of Ricky's, uh, and I, I would say um, not in terms of our film, it was not something that we addressed. It, it is something that he's interested in, he's studied, um, but it's, it's, it was really sort of outside the scope of our film, but it's a very interesting one, the whole relationship between um, religion and magic, um, and the whole relate. Actually, that we wanted to do more on the relationship of film making and magic. There's a whole tradition of early fil filmmakers who were magicians and used uh, film as a magic show. Um, so we regret not being able to do more with that. But we hope with the little flip book interludes that we would at least convey a little bit of that uh, that flavor. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, we're just going to take like three more questions, okay? So, Chuck, you direct your questions. Uh, Chuck will decide who. <laughs> All right, Chuck.
Yes, I would say his intent, I mean, really you should read some of his books and, and you'll learn a lot about that. But I, I think um, what really sp sparked my interest was the extent to which what Alan mentioned before that he brings to life this long history of this rather secretive art. And, and I think that is a big part of his, I mean, it's everything. He's a performer, he's a storyteller, he's a magician. But um, I think also the history is, he's very passionate about it and is particularly um, brilliant, I think, at combining that interest with his performance. So I, I think that, that answer um, directed at a, a musician, at, at anyone really in the arts, would, uh, would be the same. There's a love of entertaining, this feeling of, of, of power to, to be able to amaze people. Um, just the joy of, of doing it without, without uh, any audience even. Um, it's kind of the same thing, I think, that, that, that anyone involved in this, uh, basically connecting with an audience or entertaining is... is uh, and my connection to Ricky is more as an artist than as a magician, that he's a... And the film, I think, um, connects with people beyond the magic world because it's about someone trying to be an artist and the struggle is, is, that's involved. I'm not really qualified to answer the question, but I'll take a stab at it. Yeah, I, I think my, my sense is that it's a lot like a lot of other arts that, are, that have been male for a long time, and I think it's changing. Um, that's as much as I can. But there have always been women magicians as well. They're just, they're fewer, but there's a lot. I mean, Ricky has some in his collection of a French woman who uh, worked with, what was her name? There's several, there are a lot, so still a hu really a minority, but they did exist, and then they're, they're often assistants also, as you know, in big stage illusions. And All right, third and final question, somebody raise your hand. That's it, we're done. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for coming.